All right, morning, everybody. So welcome to part two. We're halfway done. <laughs> We're halfway there. I hope everybody had a good break this week. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items kind of before we get started for today. Um, first of all, as I, I talked to a few students before reading week, um, anybody who's really finding they're having trouble with the class, a few tips for you to help you get caught up. One is go see the academic success area in the library. There are peer tutors available who the college pays for and will give you some one-on-one -on -one help outside of class. Okay. There's also a, an optional textbook. I didn't require it because I don't teach straight from the book, but many people find the book will help them. The book is listed in the course syllabus on Blackboard. So if you're having a hard time in the class, um, then you need to do some extra work to get caught up so you don't fart fall too far behind as we move into some more advanced things. Um, next week is your second test. Okay, so it will be your midterm test. Um, I know you probably had a bunch of exams, bunch of tests or exams two weeks ago. I pushed ours off to a week where you shouldn't have any other tests. Okay, so the test will start right at eight o'clock next week. Um, it's not really a question and answer kind of test, it's a coding test. So I'll give you a requirement and say, write the code that will do this. I'm not exactly sure how many questions there will be, um, but there won't be an additional lesson. It's just the test next week. So be here on time to give yourself the most amount of time possible. Um, and again, if you've been having trouble in the class up until now, understanding some of the concepts, then going to the academic success area, if you haven't already been there, I would highly recommend it. You do it as soon as possible. Um, and the, the test will be closed book, so you can't use any notes or anything for that. Okay, I'm trying to evaluate what you know. Um, I haven't decided yet. Probably not. Probably what you'll be able to do is write the code in Visual Studio, and then I'm not sure if I want you to submit it as one solution or just have you copy the code and paste it into a text file and submit the text file. I will decide on that over the week. Um, okay, so I also posted information here about your tutors. The person you need to speak with is Shona. So this is in your email. And you can find her in the academic success area in the library. Okay, so usually the peer tutors will be other students either in the web program or in computer programmer who have taken this course before, probably last year, and they did very well in the course. So that's a free resource available to you that I would strongly encourage you to take advantage of if you're having trouble with kind of the basic concepts we've been working with so far. Okay, so we're going to do a couple things this week. So I'm calling it week nine because it's our ninth week of the semester, so week eight was reading week, so wonder, no, I didn't. If you're wondering where week eight, is, the week eight lesson is, there is no week eight lesson. So there are files from week seven, so our slides from our class a couple weeks ago where we did more with if statements and we worked with switch statements and my Visual Studio solution is here. And I asked you to do this little task with the switch statement. So I just want to quickly run over what that would look like. So what I asked you to do for homework was to build a simple application that had a form and on the form there was a text box and a button. And in the text box, if we typed in one of these countries and clicked the submit button, I wanted you to write a function that would display the capital city and use the case statement. So we've worked for a few weeks with using if and else. And our switch statement, this was so that we could evaluate one one value where we might have lots of different possibilities of what that value would be. So when we click the button, we grab the country. I guess I can open it up in Visual Studio, might be easier.
So yeah, I did the homework too. I didn't just ask you to do it. I did it myself. See, only seems fair. Yeah, I was maybe a little bit faster. So here was what. It, good question. I'm just going to run it and then we'll look at that. So all I had was a label, a text box, and a button. Put in one of the countries in the list that showed me the capital. So when I click the button, I grab the name of the country, and I created a function called get capital that took a string in, so a country coming in, and it returned a string, and it would send back a city going out. So I created a capital variable, which is also a string. I would pass in the name of the country. I would set the capital and then return whatever capital back here, and then I would print that out on my label. Max, I'm coming to your question here about a default. If I put in a country that wasn't in the list, I had it say unknown. I didn't require you to do that. So there were two ways of doing it. I initialized my capital variable to be unknown. So it starts out as being unknown, and if my country is any one of these, I change the value from unknown to the city. My other option would be to do this. I could initialize capital as empty, comment that out, and then I could use a default. That works the same way. So give it no no value. Check if it's any country is any one of these, and if not, set it to unknown. So those would be equivalent. You could do it either way. But yeah, we definitely want to have some kind of default value in case the country we get is none of the ones that we listed. <laughs> now all of this. This little solution is on is here on Blackboard. So if you are yet to try it, because I know two weeks is really a pretty short amount of time to write 20 lines of code. So if you didn't manage to find the time, you may want to. I would recommend taking a stab at doing this on your own. And the solution is here. It's in the week nine folder. So try it on your own. It will be good practice. There will definitely be code like this. I'm going to ask you to write on next week's test. So if you haven't tried it yet, you still have another week to attempt this. Okay, And then you can compare what you did with the solution that's on Blackboard. Now, we didn't really need a switch statement. I could have just written out a big, long if, no. else, else if, else if, else if. And it would be equivalent, it would work. But on your test, I'm definitely going to ask you for at least one example where we're using switch. So we'll evaluate one value for different possibilities. Are there any, did anybody try this and have a problem or have a question that they wanted to ask before we moved on? Okay, so I would encourage you to try this little solution if you haven't done so already. Okay, so what our subject for today is loops or repetition structures, okay, which is something we probably will never build a website or never build any application where we're not using loops. We're going to use them all the time. There's different kinds of loops, so we need to kind of understand what they are. 
So before we kind of talk about it in a programming sense, let's look at maybe some everyday examples of how things are done repetitively. And then that maybe will kind of set the scene for how we would do this when we're building a web application or another kind of application. Um, anybody spend any of their weekend in a bar or restaurant this weekend? Go out with friends, order a few drinks? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Wilson, that laugh. Okay, so let's think about what happens, right? We go out with friends or family. We're sitting around a table. Everybody orders a drink. So your server comes out of the bar with a tray of drinks. So there's, I don't know what's on here, maybe 10 or 10 drinks or so. How does each individual person get the drink? What does the server do when they bring that tray to the table? Do they put, slide the tray on the table and walk away? Okay, so they might ask who ordered what, yep, or maybe they remember, or they've written it down. And then what does the server actually do with each one of those drinks? Yeah, so one, and somebody said one at a time. So they've got a whole collection of stuff here, and it gets handed out one at a time. Right? So the server hands out a drink to each person at the table. When does the server stop handing out drinks? Yeah, when that tray is empty. And then what does the server do after that? Yeah, and then they might ask you want anything else and the server goes away. Right? So that's a repetitive process. The server actually, if you think about it, is doing the same thing over and over again. I'm going to hand each person a drink and I'm going to keep taking a drink off my tray and putting it down in front of somebody until the tray is empty. Same thing here, right? What is the cashier going to do if you're standing in the checkout line? When do you get to leave? <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. And what's her job? What does she have to do before you can leave? Just count them and tell you to pay. <laughs> right. So she's got to scan one at a time, right? You don't get at when does she ask you to pay after she scans each item? Well, it's not after she scans each item. When does she ask you to pay? Right, after she scanned all the items. So she does the same thing repetitively, right? Scan an item, scan an item, scan an item, scan an item, until there's nothing left here before your little metal bar that separates your groceries from the next person. Right. So she's going to repeat that action, keep doing the same thing until there are no more items here. Then she's going to tell you, and she doesn't tell you even even tell you the total right until it's done. So you get the total and then you pay. So there's another kind of repetitive action. Same thing here. If you're going to run, let's say this is an 800 meter race, you're going to have to run around every person. You have to run around the track two laps. So you're going to run a lap and you're going to repeat the exact same thing until it's done. So. In everyday life, we probably never think of it in, the, in these terms about re doing repetitive actions. And then we have some indicator of when we should stop, but they're things we do all the time. Well, when we're looking at building applications, we kind of do the same thing. So, for example, when we go into Facebook and we want to look at a photo album, when I click on any album, so there's 22 photos here, we actually have the same process happening here. These photos are displayed in a, a cycle or a repetition or a loop. The code here doesn't take all the photos and just stick them on the page. The code says grab all the photos in this album and one at a time display the photo, and also scale it down to this size on the page so it appears in a, as a square. So we'll keep going, displaying the photos one at a time until the end. When we look at someone's profile, we basically are seeing the same things. We're seeing all of the posts made and displayed one after the other in a loop. 
Same thing here, when we look at who liked it. Facebook's grabbing those seven names and it's displaying them one at a time, each one on a new line. So almost everything we see on any web page we go to is using this loop structure. Let's think about what's happening here. We know that the Globe and Mail's homepage is showing us the titles of news articles. So it's doing it in a loop, even though the presentation is a little bit inconsistent, um, how do they know when to stop? <laughs> right? It's, there's probably about 50 or 60 articles being displayed here, well, maybe more like 100. How did the code on this page, how does it know when to stop? Um, could be, but how do they decide which articles to show us? because this page could just keep on going forever. Whoa. So it's actually not a space issue. Okay, so they're not showing us every article they've ever published. They're showing us they're getting all the articles for today or a certain number of articles for today, and they're looping one at a time from their database and displaying the title of each article. If we log into our email, particularly if we're using a browser, same thing. If you use Hotmail or Gmail, your inbox will loop and show you one message at a time until all the messages are displayed in your inbox. So, we'll do one other example. Let's go here. If we're going to shop, when I go to my cart, we've got a loop happening here. Amazon's code is saying take all of the items in the cart and one at a time, display the photo, display the title, display the price, display the quantity, and put in a, add these links in a line, and then go ahead and add all of the items that I've put in my cart and display them on the page. And also, they need a loop so that they can total and show me what my order would cost if I go ahead and check out. Right? They're grabbing each of these values. And in a loop, they're adding them all up to show me how much I, uh, what my cost is going to be if I want to buy. So we see this stuff every day on pretty much every website we use. Anything that displays data is probably using some kind of loop, going and grabbing each piece of data and cycling through it until all the data shows on is shown to our user. So if we look at kind of our logic, and we'll look at a few different flowcharts, it's usually something like this. You can see we kind of have this circular pattern. So if we were looking at something like Facebook photo album, the logic would be something like this. Is there another photo to display? Yes or no? That's our decision. If the answer is yes, we still have more photos. We're then going to print the photo on the page and come back and then we check again. Is there another photo to display? Yep, we'll keep going. After each picture we display, we're gonna check if there are any more. And as long as there are more photos, we just repeat that cycle over and over again. And eventually, if we're gonna come to a point, so that one Facebook photo, I think it said at 22 photos on, for, of Georgian cover photos. Eventually, after it, we've displayed the 22nd photo, comes back and checks and says, are there any more, yes or no? In this case, there are no more photos, so now our code will continue on. If I click the timeline photos, 
on this page, this loop's going to run 977 times because that's got to print each picture one at a time as well as also grab the number of likes and all the comments along with it. So we can see this one's obviously going to be a lot longer as that loop runs, but eventually, after it runs 977 times, eventually that condition is going to come to be false. That question, are there any more photos? Eventually that answer is no. When we go around for the 978th time, our answer is no, so then our code can continue on. So there's a few different kinds of loops. They all work in basically the same way, but there are some small differences. So probably the one we'll use, the two we'll use most commonly, a while loop says, keep on doing something, condition is true. Program, or if we think about our cash here at the grocery store, scan the item so long as there is another item on the belt. Keep scanning the items until there are no more. That's one possibility. Our second one, and Max, this is what you were hinting at, is called the for loop. This is when we actually know we have a number we want to start at, which is usually one, <laughs> and a number we want to end at. And we want to loop and do something a specific number of times. So again, if we were running the 800 meter race, well, how long is a, how long is an athletics track? How many loops do you need? How many laps around the track do you need to do for an 800 meter race? Yeah, tracks 400 meters long, right? So we would loop two times. Um, and on this site, Max, if you suggested on Globe and Mail, for example, you said maybe it shows the hundred most recent articles perhaps. So the loop would go from one into a hundred and after it displayed the 100th link, it would stop. So sometimes, so we use while loops when we don't know how many times it's going to go around. It's just going to go around until some condition changes. So in this case, we check before each time we go around, we check our condition. And then there's this other one that's similar called a do while loop. Also, we're repeating a condition, we're repeating something while a condition's true, except we check if the condition's true after we go around. So we'll look at the difference. These are similar. The only difference is when are we checking our condition? Before each time we go around or after each time we go around? We'll look at each one of these and we'll practice some of them. So here would be an example with a while loop, thinking something like Amazon's shopping cart. So every time we the cart page loads, if I go back here, my cart should still be here. So when I click on cart, there's a decision that runs at the top of the page. And it says, are there more items in this user's cart that we haven't displayed on the page. If the answer is yes, there's another item that we haven't shown yet, we're going to display that item, the photo and the price, back around, ask again, are there more items? And we'll keep going. So in my card, this goes around four times. The answer is yes to this decision four times. My condition's true because I have four items in my cart. So each one gets displayed, and the fifth time, the code on that page says, are there more items? No. Well, then the process ends, and the page gets displayed to me. Here would be an example on a web application where we might use a for loop. We're checking out. And in the expiry, in our credit card, usually we'll see, let's say, something like the next 10 years. So if it's 2016, we'll give users the ability in the year to choose anywhere from 2016 to 2026. So the logic would look something like this. 
we're going to set a variable, probably call it year, and we'll start it at 2016. There's no point having our credit card year earlier than this year because that means the card's expired. So we're going to start at 2016, and we're going to ask, is, have we hit 2027 yet? If the answer, sorry, if our year is less than 2027, we want to put that option into a drop-down list so the user could pick that year. So, for example, I have a credit card that expires in 2019. I need to be able to pick 2019 if I'm going to buy something online and pay with my credit card. So if, as long as our year is less than 2027, we're going to put that year in a little drop-down menu, and then we're going to add one. So we'll start at 2016, put that in the list. Now our year is 2017. Now we come back and we'll check again. Have we hit 2027 yet? Nope. So let's add 2017, and we'll do this 10 times, and eventually we get to 2027. So we've put all 10 years in our list. We don't need more than that because you can't get a credit card that has more than a 10-year expiry. So there's no need to add those. So finally, when our year is equal to 2027, we'll stop our loop and end our code. The last one is a do while. So similar to this, except here again, we check our condition first before we do anything. So something like this, maybe we have a sensor. We're building something that should display a certain light as long as the temperature is above 20 degrees. So the light's green and we're constantly checking. If the temperature is above 20, we leave the light on time our condition becomes false, temperature drops below 20, we turn the light off, that condition is no longer true. So these are similar in terms of the logic, the difference is when we check our condition. And we'll try both of them so we can see the example. Okay, here's first thing I want you to do. Um, you can do this on your own or with the person next to you. I want you to go online, go on any website that you look at often that isn't Facebook or Amazon, not the ones or Globe and Mail, any other website, and I want you to find a web page where you think the programmer who built that page is using a loop of some kind. Okay, and try and figure out which of these kinds of loops do you think it might be? Okay, just take three minutes, should be all you need. So look at any website you look at often and try and find an example where you think there's a looping structure being used. We'll look at a few of them together.
You go one more minute. Okay, your three minutes are up. So here's what I want you to do. Compare your site with somebody else at your table. Okay, explain to the person next to you why you picked that site and where you see the loop. You can compare with these two guys. They're close enough. Or you can compare with Kane and uh, Ryan and Mike. You can compare what you found. Okay, I'm going to ask, starting with group at the back, table at the back, I'm going to ask for one site where you see a loop I can pull up and we can look at the rest of the class. One person's example, please. Okay. So where do you see a loop on Reddit? Okay, there is one. You're right. I mean, I can see one. Anybody want to help out? Yeah, so it's looping through, right, what the most kind of current items are being displayed here, right? So each item, each of these is another cycle or iteration through the loop, how it displays one topic at a time, one article at a time with the picture, the ranking, the comments, etc. Okay, what about you guys? we can look at okay so where do you see a loop on here
Yep. Yep, so it's looping through to display these values for trends and even just here. Okay, DJ Haywan, is there a site we can look at? I hit the PlayStation Store. Okay. What, what's the actual link? Uh, Basically, like the first like banner thing, it will show like like I did a breakdown and now I'm just rotating through a bunch of different products and stuff. Yep. And down below, there's like new movies, new games, that kind of thing shows like four of the biggest ones they want to show. Right, you got it. So in this case, so which kind of loop do you think are we are they using? Is it while loops or for loops? We for loops because it's a specified number, yeah. right? They're only showing ten items in their slider. So they're, they're going to be looping, there's going to be code looping from 1 to 10 to generate this part. Code looping from 1 to 4. So on the home page, they use a for loop. If I click see all, so we have a few loops here, right? Now they're looping from 1 to 30, so probably another for loop. But instead of stopping at four, they're going from one to show 30 at a time. So whenever we see this when we're shopping, we're looking at items, right? We know there's a for loop running, and we can see a certain number of records at a time. Okay, um, how about this table? Another example we could look at? Can we find one? There, you see a loop on here? Not yet. Okay, so what do I need to do to generate a loop? Uh, well, if you type anything in, and then you go to the last page, and last page, and last page, you simply keep looking for something. Okay, let's look for you. So if we search for Alex, okay. right, well, we get <laughs> <laughs> lots of Alexes. How many Alexes did we get? 987 million. And again, the page is broken up because it's designed to show 10 at a time, right? Yeah. So it will loop. It's kind of a loop inside of a loop. As it outputs all 987 million search results, it will break it up and show us 10 at a time. Okay. So anytime you run a search, you're generating, you know, the output, the results you get are being printed in a loop. Okay, guys, the back, another example we could look at. Okay, where do you see a loop on here? Uh, like the, the big main story there, like the Anderson emotional wind. Yep. Like cycle through the different stories. Yep, and you can, there's our little indicator, right? So what kind of loop are they using here? For loop? Yep, same thing, right? For loop from one to six. So their slider's different from PlayStation. PlayStation wants 10 items and NHL wants six. All right, uh, Max, Kane? Um, tapped out. Dot net. Tapped out. Yeah. I just gather. Um, there's a for loop for the top, um, the latest decks right there, right at the side. Yep. And if you click on one of them, they actually have a while loop, and they um, get the pictures and price information for every one of the cards in the um, deck. So you put your cursor over any of the blue highlight blue. Right. Decks. It has a picture of all the cards. Yep. All right. And even the comments, right? Whenever we see comments displayed on a web page, it's a loop. It's, there's a code that runs that fetches the list of comments and displays one comment at a time until they're all displayed and there's no more, right? And then when our loop's done, we're going to get that message printed after our loop is finished. We don't expect to see this at the in the middle of the comments. We're going to see it either at the beginning or at the end. Okay. Lavina Puni, did you find the site we could look at? Okay. 
Okay, I don't have a Tumblr login. Um, see when you log in. So it would look similar to Reddit then, the list of the list of posts. Okay. So it would also probably be is it a set number of posts or is it different a different number that show up? If it just okay, so if it just keeps going, would it be a for loop or a while loop? If it doesn't seem to end. Probably a while loop, right? Because it's indeterminate. We don't know how many are going to be there. Okay. Ryan, Mike, is there any? Sorry? Yeah, it could be. You use Reddit as well? Okay. Different plates on Reddit or the same things we already looked The front page, same thing we already looked at. Okay. So. You can probably get the idea, if these are some of the sites we look at all the time, you can pretty much start to suspect, if you're suspecting, well, pretty much almost everything we look at online, almost all the content is loops, right? That content is stored somewhere in a database, and there's code that decides either to run a loop a certain number of times, like on those sliders where we're fixing the number of times, or we're just looping until all the data is done to show all the photos, all the comments, all the articles until there are no more. So this is something we're going to use all the time. We're never going to you're never going to build websites without having looping structures. Okay. So we'll want to practice and kind of understand how they work. Um, so here's what we're going to do class today. We're going to create a new Visual Studio solution. We're going to look at the different kind of loops together. We'll build a few interfaces. And then what you guys are going to do is, um, with a partner, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of them to try in class. And the rest of class, you'll just be kind of working through all of them. Okay. Then you'll also have a lab due Wednesday night where you build a very simple game, where there's two players and you're going to build a four loop game <laughs> to determine who wins the game using loops. So let's open up Visual Studio. We'll do a quick example now, and then we'll take a break shortly. So open up your Visual Studio, and let's make a new project for today. So I'm going to make a new solution, and I'm going to call it Lesson 9. And it's going to be, as usual, a C-sharp Windows Forms application. So nothing new here. This is not the right kind of solution. So I'll close that and delete it.
Okay, so here's our form one. So I'm going to open up my toolbox. What we need on here are two labels, a text box, and a button. So I'll click on View and Toolbox. I'll open up my common controls. I'll put on a label. Two labels, actually. Text box and a button. Doesn't matter where they go. My first label, I'm going to change the instruction to say enter number. Also make the font on my form bigger so it's a little easier to see. My text box, I'm just going to change the name, text number. My button I'll rename to BTN add. And I'll change the text on my button. So we're going to ask the user enter a number. When they click the button, we're going to use a for loop to add that number to itself. And I'll change this label. I'll take out the text, and I'll call this LBL output. So we'll display, clicking the button will display a result in this label. So if the user adds 10 and clicks the button, we want the, the number to add to itself until we get to 100. And we'll want to print out all the values on our label. So if I want to write some code on the button, I'll just double click my button and Visual Studio will write the click method for me. We'll create a variable to hold the number entered. So we want to get whatever they typed in the text box. We just want to take that value and store it in a variable. We've got this little red line here saying we can't convert a string to an integer, so how do we fix that? Yeah, we'll use the convert function to take whatever number they typed in the text box. We'll convert it to an integer. Now we can store it in our variable. So I'm going to create one other variable. I'm 
I will start at zero. We're going to continually add this number to itself. So if we start with 10, our loop's going to go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, up to 100. If the user enters 20, our loop's going to go 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. So we need a variable to keep track of the current total. So here's what our for loop looks like in C-sharp. Get the word for, and a pair of round brackets, and a pair of curly brackets. So with our for, we have to say what number we're starting at, what number we're stopping at, and each time we go around, how much are we adding to our variable? So we're going to start at our user number. So if the user enters 1, we start at 1. User enters 2, we start at 2. The first value is our where we're starting. We're going to keep looping so long as our running total is less than or equal to 100. That's our stopping point. If we get past 100, we stop. Like on the NHL slider, if the counter image, the, art, the story counter gets to 7, it stops. And we're going to increment by the user number. So if the user enters 1, we're going to add one each time. If the user enters 10, we're going to enter, add 10 each time. They add 20 each time. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll create. So each time around, we'll just keep adding on whatever the original number is. So we'll keep a total that will start at zero. And we'll keep adding on whatever the user entered in the box until we hit 100. And each time we go around, we'll add that new number to our label. We'll put on a space. So if the user enters 1, we'll start at 1. We're less than 100. We'll add 1 to our count. And this will go around 100 times and print the numbers 1 to 100 on our label. Just want to make sure I did it right, so I'm going to run it, and then we'll kind of look at, dissect it a bit, what's happening here. So if I enter 20, Each time we go around, there's one problem with our logic. It works right except for one thing. We want it to stop at 120. So we want to stop at 100. So let's look at what happens.
for the first time around, we're starting at 20 and it says go until, so our total starts at zero, now our total is 20. And it outputs 20. Well, I guess I need to stop. Well, we could check after, or we can just change. I can change one thing. For the first time around, my total is 20. It prints 20 on my label. The next time around, we're at 40 because we're going adding 20 at a time. Now my label says 20, 40. Third time around. Uh, we, the problem is actually where we're stopping. We'll see in a minute. Switching those, I don't think, will give us a different result. So now we get to 100. So we've hit 100. So now my label says 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. That's what it should say. Now we want to stop. But when our condition comes around again, Wilson, what's the problem? The, it's equal to 100, so it's still running for one last time. Right. I've said, as long as my running total is less than or equal to 100, do these things. I don't want to do them again because it's already printed 100. We need to stop here. <laughs> so I don't want my code to go in here again. Max, what's the problem? What's the, what's the answer? Equal sign because you're saying equal or... Right. I shouldn't have written my condition saying do this even when it's equal to 100. Once we're at 100, we should stop. So I'll take out my equal sign. This time if I enter 20. Now we go to 100, but our loop doesn't go inside again. Once we're at 100, it stops. Let's try 50. So now this time it adds in increments of 50. If I do 10, oh, I should probably clear out my label. I realize it's about time for a break. When we first click our button, we should clear out. Our output should say nothing each time. We should empty out that lit display first, and then go through our loop. So if we do loops of increments of 10, we get 10 to 100. If we do one, <laughs> it'll go all the way. So in this case, we've used a for loop because we know where we want to stop. We have a start number, we have an end number. So we're going to practice more with for loops today. We'll do some more examples and we're going to do some while loops as well. You're going to get lots of practice and then at the end of class I'll show you the lab where you're using a for loop to do a game. So the only things we really need to remember is we need to know where to start and usually we're going to increment by one. In this case we're changing the number we're incrementing by. But most of the time with for loops, we're going to go, we'll just keep on adding one until we get to a certain number, like one to six on the PlayStation site, one to 10 on the NHL slider. 
Okay, I think this is a good place for us to take a pause. I'm going to stop my stream. We'll come back at 9.15. I'll leave the code up.